Just for background, I first met Rob maybe, what, six months ago? Uh, we were at a crowded party. You know how it is to talk at one of those things. And Rob started to tell me about this framing for AI that he's been using, called, which he calls the AI ladder. And my spidey sense went off, and I said, this is a good one. You know, like when I, you know, in my career, uh, I've, I've often used big framing ideas to help people understand how the world is changing, you know, and sort of recognizing and getting behind some of these terms has really helped people organize their thinking. And so I thought, I, I said to myself, this is a really good one. Let's really figure out how to tell this story. So this is part of that storytelling. And I'm going to ask Rob just to jump in and tell us, what do you mean by the AI ladder? Tell me what, tell the audience what you told me that night. Absolutely. You know, my, my parents always told me nothing good would ever happen at a cocktail party, but maybe this is one example <laughs> of something that good. But uh, simple concept. There is, there's no AI without IA, meaning information architecture. Any company, any individual that wants to work in AI, it starts with the information architecture, the data. The concept behind the AI ladder is think of it as all the levels of sophistication that you have to think about in terms of data, analytics, machine learning. So the base of the ladder is data collection. You need to have a fabric for how you collect data. Most data today is stored in open source repositories. So you need easy ways to access that. You need to be able to organize your data. That's the second rung of the ladder. Think of things like data catalogs. How do you organize what you're actually doing? You've got to be able to analyze your data, whether that's business intelligence, interactive dashboards, statistics, optimization. There's a bunch of different things, machine learning, obviously, in terms of analyzed data. And then ultimately, how do you infuse data and infuse AI models into your organization, which I see starting to happen right now in a significant way. So the AI ladder is about collect, organize, analyze, and fuse. If you're doing all those things, you're going to be successful in AI. Right, uh, although it, it really matters that you, you know, drill down into what you're trying to accomplish. I, I'm thinking of a really good example of somebody who climbed the AI ladder, and that's Google, uh, with uh, speech recognition. And they realized they didn't have the data that they needed. Uh, if I recall, they originally introduced some services uh, you know, that would start to collect data, and then they licensed a bunch of data from Nuance. Nuance, of course, not realizing just how important that data would be, uh, didn't make a deal that said, no, no, we keep the data, you just get to use our service. Uh, you know, Google then sort of started to bootstrap their services and build up a unique capability, which becomes self-reinforcing over time. So, Understanding what data you have uh, is one part of it, but it also seems to be understanding what data you don't have that may be strategic to you. And I think the way that you start to work through that is, is really through experimentation. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest cultural challenges I see with any organization starting to work in AI, I'll, I'll call it the ERP mentality. The ERP mentality is we're going to do one big project we're going to assign a project manager, assign 100 people, $50 million budget. That's the ERP mentality. The AI mentality or the AI culture is much more about iteration. A company should be doing 100, if not 1,000 AI experiments in the next year. Mm -hmm. Because an AI experiment is five to seven people for four to six weeks. And if you get something good, then you keep going. And if you don't, then you stop. That's agile in general. In exactly. Some sense, but yeah. I think, you know, the, the companies we work with, I, that is the biggest cultural challenge. They mm -hmm. want to rally around a single big AI project. And I say, go do 100, because if you do 100, half of them are going to fail. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that, because this is about iterations. So I think while it sounds like agile basics, in the world that I live in, a lot of the companies we work with, that's the culture piece that we're still helping them along. So let's drill down a little bit more into you know, organizing the data and thinking about it. Like, what tools should people be using from your point of view? You're obviously working with a lot of enterprise customers of IBM. 
trying to get them out of a mindset that basically thinks relational database, uh, but also has all kinds of random crap, you know, stored in little departmental, you know, uh, you know, it might even even be in spreadsheets for Christ's sake, you know. Right. <laughs> uh, but uh, how do you? What tools do you bring to bear uh, when you are, are, are trying to get companies on board? Just to give you an analogy to think about, if you, if you go into a library and you're looking for a book, the first place you go is the card catalog. I used to. But yeah. yeah, well, I still do. I love libraries. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's got a list of all the books. Yeah. And if there's 10 books, but five are checked out, you can see what's checked in, what's checked out. You can see what's been archived to microfilm. That, that idea is what is going to happen to data in every organization. So when I use the term data catalog, the analogy I would say to think about is this idea of it's a card catalog for all of your data. Whether it sits on AWS, Google, IBM Cloud, an on-premise repository, a spreadsheet, you have to have a catalog of your data assets. Just know what you have. You got to know what you have. There was yeah. an MIT study a year ago that said 80% of AI projects fail because can't find the data, can't access the data, or the data is not in a usable form. So if you don't attack that part of data organization and the data catalog piece, it's going to be you're going to get a lot of false negatives, I would say, on your AI projects. Right. You're going to say, hey, we didn't get what we wanted. And the issue may have nothing to do with AI or the model you built, but have everything to do with the data. Right. Yeah. So um, you know, do you, as you think of this as, uh, you know, uh, a, a ladder looks a lot like a stack. Is there a technology stack that goes along with this? Let's maybe let's talk about what is AI for a minute. I I created this little graphic that I posted on Twitter a couple weeks ago. I said, here's an AI taxonomy. And it's funny how much like discussion is generated just by trying to define what AI is because I don't think there's a yeah. a good general understanding of that. But I kind of went through the basic components. You need to be able to build models. You need machine learning to run models. You need the ability to manage the life cycle of your models, bias detection, anomaly detection. You need speech. You need image recognition. You need natural language processing. You need some level of data catalog or data prep. Like Those are the core components of, of how I think about AI. Now, you don't have to attack all of those at once. What, what I would say, and my view is that the, the nervous system of AI is actually going to be natural language processing. Okay. We're humans. We interact with words in all different forms. Being able to do natural language processing very well is going to be the difference. Like Obviously, in the social media world, images and speech means a lot. But as, as I look, think about enterprises and where enterprises are going, natural language processing is going to be at the core. But then you say, all right, so I've got that base. I understand what AI is. But, but you know, yeah. uh, can I uh, sort of just unpack natural language processing? Uh, you know, clearly there's a kind of natural language processing that uh, you, you, you're getting with Alexa or you know Google or Siri, uh, and it's if you think about it, it's optimized for consumer domains. And when you think about natural language processing in a business context, you've got to actually train this thing to understand vocabularies and concepts, perhaps, that we don't see in the you know, consumer world. Right. So I, I would, let me distinguish a little bit. I think most of what you see with the realm of Alexa that you described is more speech, yeah. as opposed to natural language processing. Yeah. It's almost a rules engine for when you hear this kind of phrase, yeah, yeah. say this. When I say natural language processing, I mean understanding intent. Yeah. And being able to classify intent and being able to look at a million documents and do what it takes 100 lawyers five years to do to do that in 10 seconds because you understand the language and you understand the intent that's implied. You understand the mm -hmm. structure of the, where the word is in the sentence and what that means for meaning. So I think natural language processing is a, is a significant step beyond speech. Speech is obviously an important input, but what, the reason I say it's the nervous system is Ultimately, AI is going to be about empowering humans to do their be jobs better. I believe that. Right. And so you've got to be able to do one of the core things humans do, which is reading and understanding information. So uh, let me push back on that a little bit. And, and uh, I mean, I, not, not that I disagree, you know, uh, because there are clearly applications in business 
for, uh, you know, we, we deal with documents in business. You know, you think about an insurance company, it's all documents. You know, you think about, yep. um, uh, uh, you know, finance, it's documents. But increasingly, those documents, you know, are, are really, they're an interface to data from the real world. And it's certainly possible that you can see that ability to, for, for AI to read and understand human documents as a halfway house on the way to, no, no I actually, I know the underlying data. You know, like, I don't need uh, a, a medical report that tells me what the doctor said about uh, this data. I have the data. You know, and so does that change over time? Let me, so let me give you an example to kind of bring it to life. We've done a lot of work with Royal Bank of Scotland. Yeah. Big bank, a lot of different consumers they're serving. We are now automating 40% of their inbound customer inquiries. Okay. We do that because we've got an NLP engine and a virtual agent that can basically understand basically any question that a consumer might ask. Right. And so automating 40%, because we've done that, they've now taken their customer service reps. They didn't lay them off. They said, hey, you guys can focus on the hardest problems. Yeah. And so their customer sat has gone up 25% yeah. in the same time frame. Like, when I, so when it, that is the essence. Like, at the core of that is natural language processing. But that's the essence of, why, essence of why I'm very optimistic on AI. Yeah. It's about empowering humans yeah. to do more valuable work as opposed to what can be automated. It's increased customer satisfaction. And the customers that interact with Royal Bank of Scotland have a way better experience. Yeah. And they don't even know that the, the interaction has changed to some extent. So the core of doing that requires a lot of what we talked about. Yeah. By the way, that project started with, where's our data? Do we understand the data? Are we collecting the right data? That is a good example, I think, of how we're going to start to empower people with AI. So when you, when you were training your system on these common user queries, how did you collect what were those common queries? Was that something you had already been keeping a record of, or did you begin to collect them once you started the project? And, you know, as, as, you know, wh wh where was the input? for the model, where did it come from? You know, it's very specific to the company that we work with, typically. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, it was about sitting down with the company and saying, how do you work with your consumers? They've got reams of, of documents that we could ingest to immediately train the model. And what we found with every virtual agent, even the ones that we use on our own website, to be honest, in the first 30 days, they're not very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in 60 days, they start to get decent. In 90 days, they get really good. And so it is absolutely a process of training. Mm -hmm. That will never end, by the way. Yeah. But it does get more automated over time. Because as you do intent classification and some like customer support, um, it really becomes, it, it becomes AI building AI, yeah. where after a while, we're not involved in the training. The AI is doing the training. Yeah. So you, you, you're talking about customer support as one domain. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other domains that you see your customers uh, saying, hey, this is a, a big win for our business? Customer support, I'd say, is, is the no-brainer. Every organization is going to have a virtual agent in the next yeah. couple of years. Finance, I see it starting to happen. People are trying to automate things like planning and budgeting processes, procurement, uh, supply chain comes to mind. Um, IT, I think we're on the way to where much of what we ask a CIO to do yeah. can, can be automated and, and they can focus, you know, she can focus her team on the most valuable activities. Right. Those are, I'd say, the core workflows or processes that I think AI will impact. So when, when you talk about finance, obviously there's this finance within, say, a, a manufacturing enterprise, and then there's the financial industry. In the financial industry, just let's, let's sort of imagine a hedge fund. Uh, there's an old workflow which may involve massive amounts of big data, a lot of math, and, but it's fundamentally a human being kind of saying, hey, I think this, this, partic this particular math applied to this particular data will give us a predictive result. 
Uh, in the case of an AI-based model for math, it's like you, know, you feed it a bunch of data, and the AI says, hey, uh, this, is, this is what I think uh, the data is telling us. And that's obviously a very different workflow than the human quant uh, necessarily. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of data first rather than uh, hypothesis first. And how does that, uh, you know, that, that kind of thinking, how does that start to bleed into these other areas? Again, it's an iterative process. I don't think anybody's really figured out, I'd say, a magic wand on things like quant work if we yeah. did you and I'd probably be doing that instead. <laughs> um, but I think, look, the, the biggest impact I see in financial institutions is things like uh, reg tech and compliance. Yeah. You can use AI to solve a lot of compliance issues in an oh, automated you, oh, so, so basically what you're saying is that the secret power of AI is being a bullshit detector? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, perhaps. <laughs> um, but look, there's, you know, there's new regulations coming, like SR 11.7 that says you have to be able to understand your models, the data yeah, provenance, yeah. where it came from. Yeah. Like, no financial institution can hire enough people uh -huh. to do that. Yeah. So, again, it may not be the most exciting stuff to talk about, but it's really practical in terms yeah. of what companies have to get done. Yeah. So let's come back to the sort of this idea of the ladder as sort of just sort of breaking down this, uh, you know, the set of things and capabilities you need to build for your company. Uh, what skills do, are companies most lacking typically? And uh, what infrastructure are they most lacking? When you're talking about, you know, old line enterprise companies that are saying, well, we want to get us some of that AI stuff. Uh, what do we do? Yep. There was a there was a report, McKinsey report, two weeks ago that said global shortage of data scientists is two hundred fifty thousand and is mm -hmm. going to get worse. Yeah. So without a doubt, there's a shortage of data science skills. Yeah. And you know that's Python. Um, you know, if you want your kids to have a job, to have them learn Python, it's a guaranteed guaranteed employment for a long time. Um, so there's there's the whole realm of data science, there's certainly a gap. We can solve a lot of that through AI that builds AI. Things like if we can automate feature engineering, which we're doing right now inside of Watson, or automate algorithm selection, you can actually make that, you can, you can narrow that skill gap. Um, that's a challenge. Infrastructure, I don't see as a big issue. Yeah. The great benefit of but, uh, the cloud world we live in is you can kind of get whatever you want Right, but are, are companies already over that hump of kind of getting to the cloud where they have easy access to computation and data for the, at the level that they need? I see a pretty big reluctance to take, I'll call it core data, sensitive data, and move that to cloud still, to public cloud. That's why we do a lot with private cloud on Red Hat, that type of thing. But I think if you mask those data sets, then you can do experimentation. That goes back to data organization, mask. Yeah protect sensitive data. I see people slowly getting over that hump, uh, but I think it will be a combination of public cloud and private cloud work for how this right. is done. Yeah, so we're running uh, towards the end of our time, so let me just ask you for uh, any concluding thoughts. If, if, if you're in front of a customer who really has not thought about AI for their business, they are you know, just starting to, to say, well, well, how is it different? How will it change things for me? What do you tell them? Like, First, there's still a fear factor on this topic. I think you almost have to acknowledge that. And I tell clients, AI is not going to replace managers, but managers that use AI are going to replace the managers that do not. <laughs> and they've really got to think of this as, if your competition's using this and you're not, you're not going to be relevant. And so you kind of have to I'd say dispel the fear, but then wake people up that, that now is the time. We, we've kind of gotten through the hype phase of AI. Mm -hmm. Now is when the real work starts. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. And it's fundamental challenges around data and culture and skills, those things that we talked about. But now is the time. And if you're going to wait another year or 24 months to get started, you may be too late. Yeah. So now is the time. Yeah. Now is the time. That's probably a, uh, a good way to wrap. Well, thanks a lot, and, and good luck uh, getting more uh, companies trying new things, trying them faster. And uh, 
Uh, I think there's so much opportunity in today's world. Uh, it's a wonderful quote that I, I, I love to leave people with uh, from Paul Cohen, who was the DARPA program manager for AI and now runs the information sciences program uh, at Pitt. He said, the opportunity of AI is to help humans model and manage complex interacting systems. And boy, we're heading into a world where we need that capability and we need it to be amped up uh, to the highest level to solve some of the massive uh, interactive, uh, complex interacting systems problems uh, that the world faces. So uh, uh, good luck to you in getting more enterprises on the bandwagon. <laughs> thanks, Tim. All right, and thanks. starts with everybody in this room. Thank All you, right, guys. Thank you. All right. All right. <laughs>